And it's my great joy to introduce Professor Judith Heron, who is a very well-known historian and archaeologist. She is the Emeritus Professor of Late Antique and Byzantine Studies at King's College London. After a long career teaching Byzantine and medieval history, notably at Princeton University and King's College London, she retired to pursue her research, which is currently centered on the city of Ravenna and its anonymous cosmographer. Judith was elected president of the International Association of Byzantine Studies in 2011 and 2012, and is the founding editor of Translated Texts for Byzantinists, a series published by Liverpool University Press. She's widely published, and she was awarded, in addition to many other honors, in 2016, the Dr. A. H. Heineken Prize for History. And we're so excited that she and her husband, Anthony, have been here with us at the Abbey for a few days. It's been a joy to share your good company and hear your wonderful stories and to enjoy your smiling faces. And we look forward to your lecture, Judith. Thank you so much, Father Ambrose. And I must begin by thanking the monastery for this welcoming hospitality, which has been such a pleasure. We have had the most wonderful accommodation here and are feeling truly blessed with the, with the, ple the pleasure of staying with you and seeing uh, the, the setting of this wonderful event. And secondly, I want to thank Howard and Roberta Amundsen for much generous support over years, so deeply appreciated, and for the extraordinary generosity in funding all these events which are taking place this weekend and next, and which will allow us to appreciate the quite extraordinary thing, from, from, I find it extraordinary, that a new monastery built to this great size is now being endowed with such an important library. What a wonderful, wonderful development. Now, I want to also say that Professor Shaw has just talked about Henry Chadwick. And I must add, my own experience of meeting this great man was as she described it. I was attending, a, I was asked to give a paper at a seminar in Oxford. I'm not an Oxford person. I was not trained in Oxford. I went to Cambridge University. <laughs> <laughs> but I was... Uh, told that the seminar was held in a room up some stairs in a college. And as I went to the college, I realized I was following Henry Chadwick up the stairs. And I thought, he's coming, and I've got to give the paper? <laughs> I mean, I was both terrified and deeply honored. And it was just as, as, as Jane has expressed. He listened very intently. He made a few critical comments, and afterwards he said to me, that was really splendid, but you know, you might have thought about X and Y. And I really enjoyed it, he said. And I, you know, that sort of encouragement for a younger scholar from senior faculty who do not normally go to, undergrad, or to graduate seminars in Oxford University. I was really, really honored and deeply impressed. And then every time we met, it was that easy, friendly, such a generous nature. You couldn't but love the man. And then, through the Amundsons, I had the great fortune to meet Tom Oden on one of the, your, their many visits to London, on trips to European centers. And Tom Oden was there with the group. And I was so deeply impressed to learn about his work and then to read how Africa shaped the Christian mind and to realize that he had put on the, on the map of early Christianity that much neglected part of sub-Saharan Africa and all the extraordinary developments in Christian thinking that had taken place and were so frequently overlooked, partly because they might have been written in the different sorts of Ethiopic or other languages not deciphered or not understood very widely. And I think that the importance of acquiring these two great collections is that their spirits, the, the spirits of these great scholars, will live on in a novel environment to inspire centuries to come 
of scholars who want to learn about what they did. And this will live on in their books. Now for the lecture, uh, I did not choose to bring you slides. In the seventh century, there were no selfies. <laughs> we do not have portraits, we do not have pictures of church councils, except from much later. And I thought the simplest thing is for me to tell you in advance what I would try to do and to hope that you can follow. Roberta suggested I might talk about some of the issues in my latest book on Ravenna, or the formation of Christendom, which has just been reissued as a classic uh, by Princeton University Press. And as this is an occasion when we've finally all been able to come together, even during the pandemic, I've decided to focus on one very important, revealing, but little studied moment of ecumenical unity. The Sixth Universal Council held in Constantinople in the years 680 to 681. This ecclesiastical gathering shows the constant, creative, and self-confident development that I argue should be called early Christendom rather than late antiquity, and that's the backdrop to my formation of Christendom. It also illustrates the formative challenge of Islam and how Christendom responded to this, its extraordinary expansion into and domination over the Eastern Mediterranean. And then it also marks the surrender of Constantinople's suzerainty over the Church of Ravenna to Rome, and the end of Constantinople's claim to rule the single Roman world. I will begin with the background to the council, then I will look at its proceedings, with a detour into the importance of the libraries that are cited, and finally I will assess its impact. So first, the, the council was summoned by the Emperor Constantine IV, who ruled from his capital, New Rome, Constantinople, from 668 to 685. And during that reign, he decided to end a debate over the precise natures and wills of Christ, the divine and the human. The monothelite, one-will interpretation adopted in the East had provoked a schism with the West, led by the Church of Rome. This problem of how to identify the human and the divine elements in Christ and the Son's relationship to God the Father had preoccupied Christian theologians for a very long time. To understand the significance of this Trinitarian issue, it's important to set it in a world determined to emerge from the pagan world of Greco-Roman culture. In that culture, many gods and secular rulers who demanded to be venerated with animal sacrifices and burnt incense, the Christian belief in one god was fundamental. And many believers were martyred for the denying the power of the pagan deities and the emperors who ruled under their auspices. In contrast to the monotheism of the 12 tribes of Israel, Christian monotheism was universal, a promise to life beyond the world in the hereafter that was open to all, women and slaves included. Through his incarnation, Christ, the Son of God, had made possible this salvation. But his earthly existence and the centrality of the Holy Spirit in spreading the good news embodied in the Trinity, this provoked difficulties. Defining the triad of the divine elements, the three persons within one Godhead, was challenging. But Christian theologians were determined not to go back to any form of polytheism. In the effort to settle the relationships between the three and the nature of the divine and human qualities in Christ, they had many debates and disagreements. We have to go back rather a long way to the year 325, when Constantine the Great summoned all the bishops of the Christian world to meet. He was anxious for them to formulate a single definition of Christian faith. 
the emperor wanted to establish an accepted form that could be observed throughout his realm. One god, one empire, united under one ruler. The bishops assembled at Nicaea, perhaps as many as 318, were instructed to agree on a definition of, of their faith, and the Nicene Creed, as it has come to be known ever since, was proclaimed in 325. Later, this meeting was identified as the first universal ecumenical council. Its decisions also branded alternate interpretations of Christian faith as heretical. Arius, a priest from Alexandria, and two bishops were excommunicated and sent into exile for refusing to accept that Christ, the Son of God, was consubstantial with the Father. Instead, Arius argued that the Son had been created by the Father, was naturally inferior to the Father, and could not share the same nature. And this view was condemned at Nicaea. That all three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, shared in the same nature, physis, and substance, usia, was considered essential for the preservation of a truly monotheistic faith in the one God. Despite the Council's success in establishing this consubstantiality in the creed, Nicaea failed to suppress the heresy associated with Arius. After a short period in exile, the emperor allowed him to return to Constantinople, where Arius died in 333. Four years later, Constantine was baptized on his deathbed by Bishop Eusebius of Nicomedia, a supporter of Arius. And Constantius II, his eventual successor, promoted the doctrines associated with Arius and persecuted Christian leaders who remained loyal to the Council of Nicaea. So there was a complete reversal of the decrees of, of Nicaea 325. And in the middle of the fourth century, the emperors insisted on, an Ari on Arian definitions and persecuted the others. So the debate over the divine and human natures of Christ continued through the following centuries in different combinations and definitions. At the Fourth Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon, held in 451, Pope Leo's letter, called the Thomas, set out a wording that was supported throughout the West, while large numbers of Eastern bishops preferred the definitions made by uh, Cyril, Patriarch of Alexandria. Disagreements and alterations came to a head in the early 7th century when the Emperor Heraclius and the Patriarch Sergius of Constantinople emphasized Christ's single nature, monophysis, single operation, monoenergia, and single will, monothelesis. In 635, Pope Honorius expressed some support for the notion of the single will in Christ. And perhaps this encouraged the emperor and the patriarch of Constantinople to make monothelitism, its belief in the one will, its imperial policy. One year later, they issued a document called the Ecthesis, a legal definition which also forbade any further discussion. But Heraclius' attempt to assert and reassert Christian unity coincided with the triumphant military campaigns of the Arabs. And they were inspired by the new revelation of Islam. Although there is no documentary evidence for this, I am convinced that this was no mere coincidence. In 634, the Arabs captured Damascus and conquered large areas of the East Mediterranean world. The great Christian centers of Jerusalem, Antioch, and Alexandria rapidly passed under Muslim control. This new monotheism, combined with the Arabs' military advance, presented a very serious challenge to the Christian communities of the area and to the emperors in Constantinople. The Prophet Muhammad had received the revelation of Islam, submission to Allah, the one God, as the final message of that God, 
that was designed to supersede both the Old Testament of the Jews and the New Testament of the Christians. The problem of Christ's nature was resolved by asserting that he was a mortal prophet, not the one true God. And although conquered people were not obliged to embrace the new faith, financial advantages meant that many went over to Islam. Heraclius witnessed the loss of Egypt and other rich provinces to Arab control and to Islamic belief. In the West, however, which was not yet threatened by Islam, the emperor's declaration of monotheletism was immediately condemned. In 649, Pope Martin summoned his bishops to correct its theological errors at the Lateran Synod, guided by the eminent Greek theologian and monk Maximus the Confessor. At this Roman council, the claims of monotheletism were fully discussed and rebutted in a detailed denunciation. Pope Martin declared that the two natures and two wills of Christ, the divine and the human, were united in his incarnate person. This opened another schism between the two halves of Christendom. Constantinople led with, let, dealt with the Roman opposition by military force, removing Pope Martin and Maximus and putting them on trial for treason. Their deaths in exile can only have deepened the chasm between East and West, which was confirmed in 662 by the official adoption of monotheletism in Constantinople at a council of Eastern bishops. Meanwhile, the Arabs displayed their military ambition to ca capture the imperial metropolis. In 667-9, they waged a three-year siege of Constantinople with a massive land and naval force. The imperial capital held out behind its massive fortifications. And later, once the Emperor Constantine IV had secured a major victory over the Muslim forces because the Christian forces fought back very firmly, he imposed a peace treaty and realized that it was time to restore Christian unity. This decision demonstrates a sense of what today we might call ideological weakness in the face of Islam. The Muslims had proclaimed a single God whose authority had been announced by many prophets, including Jesus and, finally, Muhammad. Muslims and Islam took over the universal claims of Christianity, and, they, and it spread rapidly, not only within the Christian ecumeni, but as far east as Indonesia. Against this, the churches were seemingly divided over how they defined the singularity of God and the nation of the relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It seems reasonable to assume that it was this that led Constantine IV to decide that unity in the face of the threat from Islam took priority over any disagreements with Rome, even if this meant abandoning the doctrine of monotheletism. In 678, the emperor announced plans to summon another universal council of all bishops in Christendom, quote, to achieve the unity of God's holy churches, end quote. And he sent an invitation to Rome. This letter was probably carried to the West by Theodore, the exarch governor of Ravenna, with control over Italy, including the city of Rome. Since the mid-sixth century, when Justinian I had ordered imperial forces to recapture Ravenna, Exarchs had governed the regions reconquered, which included a vast area of southern France, later included Spain, and of course uh, maintained Sicily as a very important island between east and west uh, in the Mediterranean world. This exarch, Theodore, sent the imperial invitation on to Pope Agatha, who welcomed its proposals. After all, he said, this is a return to the, the theory we have always maintained. It's our doctrine. And which, that is the doctrine which we call duotheletism, reference to the two natures, human, human, humane and divine. 
And the Pope therefore summoned his suffragan bishops to agree a response to the proposed council. And early in 680, 125 signed their assent to a long document which was taken to Constantinople. Pope Agatha also invited Christians distant from Rome to hold their own local councils, and at least in Milan and in Hartford, England, bishops met and agreed with the proposal for unity. Although there is no explicit information about how such a significant change was arranged, it's very likely that the exarch, as the imperial representative in, based in Ravenna, would have played a major role. His influence may be seen in the choice of the papal team that was appointed to travel to Constantinople. It included three bishops with a good knowledge of Greek, several priests and monks, and Theodore, a humble priest from Ravenna, to represent the archbishop of that city. Meanwhile, in the east, Constantine IV had to take steps to ensure the agreement of his eastern bishops. The first step was to replace the patriarch. The new leader, George, uh, was appointed because he would support the new policy of unity and would preside at the council. But it proved much more difficult to persuade all the other bishops because of the entire ecclesiastical hierarchy had adopted the doctrine of monothelitism as correct theology 18 years earlier in 662. Many of them refused to give up the belief in Christ's one will, which they held to be correct, and would not accept the proposed change to the two natures and wills of Christ. There was much less enthusiasm in the East than in Rome for the new council. Nonetheless, early in November 680, and we are now going to look at the proceedings of this great council, the emperor presided at the first meeting, which was opened, as was customary, with the ritual of setting up the gospels on a throne and the reading of the acts of past ecumenical councils. Minutes of all 18 sessions held from this moment in 680 through to the last in September 681 preserve a detailed record of the discussions. They allow us to follow arguments based on the Greek and Latin texts cited. For example, at the third session, when the Acts of the Fifth Council held in 553 were read, the Roman party disputed the Constantinopolitan version of a letter written by Pope Virgilius and demanded to examine the records. In the Eastern versions, they found alterations to their own understanding of the text. They had brought their own version of Pope Virgilius's original letter. And so they condemned the Eastern versions as false. And they said there were insertions which were forgeries. Thereafter, every document cited, whether against or in favor of monothelitism, was subject to the most stringent checking every theological text presented to the council was scrutinized, and where there was any doubt about the wording, this was compared with copies held in the patriarchal library. In this way, various differences were identified, mainly in the monothelite citations, which had been subtly altered to enhance the one will doctrine. These references to the patriarchion the patriarchal library in Constantinople, remind us of the significance of such collections. And I wish to make a little detour through these libraries because they are so interesting and they reflect so well on the importance of your new monastic library here. In addition to this theological library run by the patriarch, the imperial library in the great palace consisted of many bound manuscripts uh, used by emperors, courtiers, scholars, and the teachers employed in the palace school. These enormous resources are constantly displayed in the 8th and 9th century disagreements over icon veneration and the opponents of icon veneration. They are found in the writings of Photius, who was also patriarch of Constantinople, and who had recorded the seven 
279 books he had read and summarized for his brother in a book aptly called The Library, Bibliotheki. But he thus preserved texts no longer in existence today, such as the fifth century history of Olympiodorus or the uh, ecclesiastical history of uh, Philostorius. In the 10th century, this imperial library provided Emperor Constantine VII with material for his wide-ranging Encyclopedia of All Knowledge in 53 volumes. Nearly all of them are lost. Only volume 22 on embassies is preserved. It is a tragedy that we have none of the other 52. Another anonymous collection, the Suda, brought together a lexicon of Greek names and terms that provide a catalogue of bibliographical information, sans pareil. The Monastery of Studios in the capital clearly had an impressive collection used by Saint Theodore, the abbot, to document his opposition to iconoclasm. Personal collections and private libraries existed. We read, for example, of the books owned by a military general. And the lending and copying of manuscripts indicate lively literary production. Nearly all of these libraries were destroyed in 1204. The great sack of Constantinople by Western crusaders led by the Doge of Venice. Outside the capital, the monasteries on Mount Athos, in Palestine and at Sinai, preserve very significant libraries. For instance, the earliest biblical text in 347 leaves removed from St. Catherine's Monastery at Sinai by Tischendorf that ended up in St. Petersburg were put up for sale by Stalin in 1933 and were acquired by the British Library, which is why you see the volume there now today. Particular skills in copying and binding can now be identified, such as the 10th century team of Georgian monks at Sinai, who rebound many of the library's manuscripts. Much later, a particular pink leather used by binders attached to a Constantinopolitan monastery, has made possible the attribution of texts copied and rebound there to specific scribes. And of course, Mount Athos continues to collect and maintain the richest orthodox theological libraries to this day. Now back to 7th century Constantinople, where Constantine IV continued to preside at 10 more sessions of the council until March 681. And then he was represented by civilian figures. But this lay presence did not alter the ecclesiastical nature of the meeting, which was dominated by debates over the correct definition of the human and divine aspects of Christ's person. The procedure of checking every citation involved the council participants in an innovative intellectual activity to establish the authenticity of texts brought from several libraries. Greatest attention was paid to the claims made by the monothelite leader, Patriarch Makarios of Antioch, who had prepared a list of authorities to support his one will interpretation. At the eighth session, in his Confession of Faith, he added a reference to the one will in Christ to the creed agreed at Chalcedon in 451. Makarios explained that in Christ there was no sin, and since the human will is sinful, Christ's will must have been divine. This was related to Christ's suffering, which was a matter of the flesh, therefore human, but had occurred through God's will. The text from the Garden of Gethsemane, thy will be done, O Father, thy will be done. There could be no opposition to the divine will in the human Christ. Makarios' texts in support of the monothelitism were then read, analyzed, and dismissed. In numerous instances, George, the patriarchal archivist, was sent to bring copies of the same texts from the library 
and the experience of questioning the formulation of every citation set a precedent for the future. Now, although Pope Agatho died and was buried in January 681, the Council continued its negotiations in Constantinople, and on the 21st of April, John, the Bishop of Portus, officiated at a mass in Latin in the Hagia Sophia, in the presence of the Emperor and the Patriarch. This truly ecumenical event is noted as the high point in the restoration of the Union of Churches. On the 16th of September, the Emperor opened the final session when the successful result was officially announced and seven obdurate monothelites, including Patriarch Makarios, were ordered into exile in Rome. The papal party took charge of them and they returned in the winter of 681 and the heretics were sent to live in separate monasteries. I think this may be a reference to the monastic prisons that we mentioned <laughs> yesterday. And I think you can be sure that these monothelites were given nothing but duothelite theology to study. <laughs> and indeed, Pope Leo II did in fact convert two of those seven, and they were readmitted to, to communion in Rome at Epiphany 683. So there was some good results. <laughs> Both Greek and Latin accounts of the Sixth Ecumenical Council provide detailed evidence of the ways that the prelates discuss the differences in their doctrinal beliefs. This presupposes a remarkable degree of theological sophistication, as well as multilingual capacity and probably some efficient translators. For 10 months, the papal team resided in Constantinople and participated in many imperial ceremonies. Liturgical feasts, such as the processions uh, to the shrines of martyrs where liturgies were performed, and thus they witnessed Eastern styles of ecclesiastical celebration. They were probably influenced by the pervasive use of icons in worship, in the Eastern style of church decoration, in mosaic, and as well as the Greek style of chanting that differentiated, differentiated the East from Western customs. In addition to the Declaration of Unity, there was another aspect of the Council that is not so evident, although it turned out to be equally important. This lies in the conditions that Pope Agatho had imposed on the Emperor Constantine IV before the Union could be agree agreed. These are basically economic and ideological features which are barely mentioned in the Roman record, the Liber Pontificalis, but they led on inevitably to a later separation from, of Rome from Constantinople at the very moment when the unity of the churches was being proclaimed. I'll just mention four of these. In the first place, Pope Agatho petitioned the emperor to remove the fee normally paid for the ordination of the pontiff, though the old custom of waiting for a general decree from the imperial city remained. And this request was granted by imperial mandate. Later, Pope Benedict also received permission from Constantine IV for the person then elected Bishop of Rome to be consecrated immediately without waiting for the imperial mandate, a general decree. The Pope also received locks of hair from Constantine's children, Justinian and Heraclius, which were sent to the Pope, to the clergy, and to the army in a traditional ceremony designed to reinforce the relationship between Constantinople and Rome. The return of the Church of Ravenna to Roman control, which took place before Ju July uh, 683, was also part of the agreement, though not mentioned in the Pope's doctrinal letter. This reversed a short period of independence when the Church of Ravenna had en enjoyed uh, its independence, its autocephalia, under Archbishop Maurus. New terms were now stipulated for every newly elected Bishop of Ravenna to be consecrated at Rome. Pope John V 
who had held office 685 to 6, had been a deacon on the papal team, in the papal team, sent to Constantinople to the council and had returned with the acts and other imperial mandates that favored Rome. And from these, we learn that the emperor had ordered the abolition of taxes which the Church of Rome had previously paid to Constantinople. The annona capita from the Roman patrimonies of Sicily and Calabria, the compulsory purchase price of corn, and various other taxes which the church had been unable to pay. It represents a major concession by Constantinople over funds raised in Italy to sustain imperial government. It was damaging to the imperial treasury and somewhat humiliating. It also contributed to the growth of papal independence from Constantinople and prepared the later division of Christendom into the Latin West and the Greek East. However, a, a final reference to the decisions taken at the Sixth Ecumenical Council is recorded in the reign of Justinian II, son and successor of Constantine, when he wrote to Pope Conon, urging him to maintain the acts of the Sixth Ecumenical Council undefiled and unshaken. In the imperial capital, the new emperor's dedication to the reunion of the churches took a very particular form. He ordered all his leading generals and provincial governors to come to the imperial city where the acts were read aloud to all. No copies of the document were issued because they knew written records might be subject to alteration, incorrect copying, or even forgery. All the officials were instructed to listen and commit to memory the correct understanding of the natures and wills of Christ. And then they were to abide by that doctrine. So in both the major centers of Christian leadership, Constantinople and Rome, support for the Sixth Ecumenical Council of 680 to 681 was thus reaffirmed. It was a rare moment of doctrinal unity backed by imperial military authority. It also marked a new relationship between the two centers. In order to achieve the reunion, Constantinople had to allow Rome to increase its prestige and standing in the Ecumene by removing certain taxes previously paid and by permitting the consecration of an elected candidate as Pope without payment and without waiting for imperial agreement. By giving up significant economic and procedural aspects of imperial control, Constantine IV and his son Justinian II recognized the reality of a seventh century Mediterranean now occupied along its eastern and southern coasts by the forces of Islam. The emperors could not continue to rule every aspect of Italian government. Independent powers were thus conceded to the Bishop of Rome whose stature increased to rival the Patriarchal Church of Constantinople, which was the only other major center of Christian culture. It is perhaps significant that this development occurred when the See of Rome was held by a series of bishops with bilingual knowledge of Greek and Latin, who had traveled to the Eastern capital or knew of the imperial church and court through eyewitness records. I think John, the Bishop of Portus, was a key, a key figure here. These popes were able to demand additional privileges in return for the union that Constantinople desired. A key feature was Roman control of the Church of Ravenna. At the same time, Justinian II was seriously challenged by Muslim and Bulgar hostilities and neglected the advances of the Lombards in northern Italy. And Ravenna was therefore deprived of military power and the exarch was unable to defend Rome militarily. Although the Sixth Council was weakened by the regulations later decreed that cast a shadow over its achievements, the great canonist, Gratian, accepted that they formed part of the Sixth Ecumenical Council, which had decreed the union of churches. The council was recorded as an important declaration of Christian unity and was defended by Rome only a few years later. It was included every time the ecumenical councils were cited, but the Sixth Council also entailed the growth of the papacy 
as an independent political as well as ecclesiastical center, as well as marking another stage in the loss of imperial control over Rome. The events of 680 to 81 should be recalled as a specific moment in the history of the, of the Western Roman Empire, which had been sustained by Constantinople through its links in the city of Ravenna, its imperial capital, and across the Mediterranean. As the Muslim conquest of the southern and eastern shores of the Great Sea established a new monotheistic faith to rival both Judaism and Christianity, the Roman Empire retreated from its western base in Italy to concentrate on preserving the eastern half based in New Rome, Constantinople. Theology, political control, and military force contributed to a new structure of the Ecumene in which old Rome, under episcopal control, could assert its authority under the theme of imperial emulation and substitution in the process of inventing the papacy, phrases of uh, Rosamund McKitterick. In conclusion, it was the unexpected and terrifying Arab conquests and the rapid spread of Islam that disrupted the ancient unity of the Mediterranean world. Although the churches came together to proclaim unity in the face of this challenge, their theological agreement could not prevent a gradual separation. The Church of Rome distanced itself from the East, while the empire adjusted to the loss of vast territories and resources, especially Egypt. From the mid-8th century, a series of locally trained pontiffs in the, directed the Church of Rome, abandoned their reliance on Constantinople, and sought military assistance from the Frankish kings north of the Alps. But the efforts made by both sides in 680 to 81 would continue to resound whenever the acts of the ecumenical councils were read. And as this was a regular practice, it provided a recapitulation of orthodox belief. It was an appreciation of the diversity of customs as legitimate and proper, not a matter for contention or polemics. In this way, the events associated with the Sixth Ecumenical Council can be celebrated even today as one of those critical moments when previously estranged Christian leaders come together to reaffirm their fundamental beliefs. And at a time when divisions, religious and political, appear to be hardening, it's salutary to remember that even radical disagreements can be overcome. Thank you. Professor Heron, thank you so very much. This was a, a, a master class for us in what an expert historian can do <laughs> with the record of history. We, we're so used to looking at ecumenical councils from a merely theological point of view, especially we who are churchmen. And so to hear you, to watch you, to witness you take these threads and bring together the, not only the political, but also then to the, those subtleties that only you can notice <laughs> and then elaborate and then also show us some of the other implications of such ideas. It's a great joy for us. Thank you very much. Please. And, and if you wouldn't mind, Professor, we have just a few minutes for questions in case there are a few questions. Father Hugh. Just two uh, very simple questions. One uh, historical. Did the papal party uh, in Constantinople, did they stay at St. Sergius and Bacchus? Where St. Gregory's did, was that still the papal? No, they stayed in the, in the, in the palace of Placid Placidia, oh. which was actually named after the Placidia of, of uh, the Theodosian uh, dynasty and had been maintained as the papal base uh, for the Apocrisiarii of Rome, who whenever they were, re who were resident in, in Constantinople regularly. And indeed, they always lived there. And one of the uh, great... Uh, irritations um, that uh, occurred uh, in some disturbances when people broke into the palace and, and desecrated the altar. And this was considered a really very serious, heinous crime, and they had to be tracked down and punished. Yeah, thanks. 
and then and then the nowadays it's regularly presented that the, the issue is more not of the with the monophysism, for example, that it's not the monos but miaphysis, and then one will mia yes. instead of monos. Now with, that that's presented often now as a, as a way to resolve an impasse, but I don't I don't suspect that at at the time that that was a, a live option, or am I mistaken? No, I believe miaphysis is a, a neologism. Right, exactly. Uh, and it is adopted uh, by contemporary scholars. Yeah. Uh, and of course, physis is, is feminine, so mia is more appropriate. Yes, right. And the difference between mia and mono is of a subtlety right. that, is, that they think is necessary to make that distinction. D but the distinction between unique time, and, and only, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. But at the time, there was this constant emphasis on mono, mono energia, the only uh, operation in Christ. That and, and the mono uh, uh, thelesis, which is the only will. And this uh, singularity was stressed constantly uh, against the duo thelesis and the duo thesis, which is, it doesn't sound good, does it? But we, we know what it means. It means two, not one. <laughs> and that was the contrast that was drawn at the time. Thank you. Yes, Roberta. You want to wait for the microphone? Yeah. Oh, she might be live still. Oh. Um, you referred to the speculation of the impact of, of facing Islam and its very strict monotheism. In fact, I, I think the Muslims called the Christians polytheists. Um, how, I mean, there's probably no way to know but is, how much impact did that have on their deliberations that they were facing this, this enemy that was military, certainly, yes. um, but also theological, yes. theologically challenging? Yes. I think the notion of a tripartite God was very, very difficult for Christians to explain to themselves three persons in one Godhead not polytheism, not many, many, many gods, only the one God, but in these three different persons. And the Muslims just said, oh, they're just like the pagans, three gods. What well, well, next, they'll have 100 gods. So it was a challenge, and I think although um, the sources uh, for, uh, which describe how the Eastern Roman Christians were, became aware of Islam, uh, there are stories about Muhammad and his upbringing. One of the things that is recorded is that he went to Mecca and he destroyed the idols. And these were pagan idols of the gods that had, and goddesses that had served the pre-Islamic uh, Arabic tribes. So there was, from the very beginning, an understanding that the Muslims had exercised iconoclasm in order to sustain an aniconic culture and Muhammad was not even buried in a marked grave. So there were very strict notion, well, the, whether the Christians really understood that, but there were strict, un there were understandings of the strict and iconic culture of the Muslims. And that was, of course, something that was going to cause endless problems in the seventh and eighth centuries. Mm -hmm. But at this moment, they, they, are very, they are very much more aware of the military strength of Islam and the threat that it's going to overtake all of the Christian centers, that even Constantinople will fall, and there'll be no more patriarchs. They will all take refuge in Rome, in fact. That would have been the, that would have been the, the conclusion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 